format here working on some things just having some fun of course um today i'm going to be doing and, and dealing with something um don Preston has put out and everything else and so but this here as you can see is a challenge to him and i want to point out a few things um that I, it's kind of hard i've been in a discussion with david green who of course is the author one of the authors of um house divided and uh you know, David Green, Edward Hassert, and Michael Sullivan uh, in a discussion. And uh, I'm responding to some of the comments that he made and John made in his last video, John Watson's video, about how he got kicked out of uh, a Church of Christ. And uh, he was very indignant and said, this is just not Christian-like. That's just not Christian-like. Um, but I would hate to say, if, let's just say, for example, at your church, wherever it might be, if a Mormon came into your church and sat there and wanted to start having a Bible discussion and a debate with you or, you know, talk about their theology um, or to the people and have a debate or a discussion, um, I don't think you would allow it. You wouldn't want somebody to come into your, your church service uh, preaching on something like that. And I think John Watson doesn't understand. Yes, it's a different view. Yes, it's a different theology and things, but... That's the way you might view it, but the way the rest of us look at it and understand it, uh, full preterism is basically lying about Jesus and say he came when he did not. To us, it's all lies. This would be like saying, just like what the Mormons said, after his death and resurrection, he came over to America and had a group of people there and talked to and everything else. We know that's all lies. We know it's all lies. So why are we going to have a discussion and debate about something that we know is completely false and is a heresy? And so the Bible tells us for those kind of heretical people, of course, is kick them out, out of here, gone, goodbye, whatever. Uh, so there's no way we're going to have a discussion with you. So uh, now concerning me uh, with David, David Green and everybody else. Um, Somebody's calling my name. I gotta, I gotta ignore that. Uh, is after my studies and everything else, I've been at, going at this with uh, preterism now for six years, a little over six years or so. When it, I first heard about it and been, and been talking about it, and I've talked with just about every from Don Preston all the way through. Now, Don Preston has blocked me. Um, unlike Lance Connolly and others, I've never, I have never ever uh, been disrespectful to him. I have never called him names. I've never put him down. I have d disagreed with him. And have stated such and, and stated the opposite opinions of things that he has said. Um, and he, of course, is not going to like that very well. But no, I've never been disrespectful to the man whatsoever. Um, and he's had me in the block now. And I'm asking him to unblock me so that he can at least deal and respond with me. Um, I've written my book, um, Full Preterism, The Assault on Orthodox Christianity. Of course, he'll never get a copy of that and read that for himself. I'm sure he won't. Um or even deal with it. He'll deal with Lance's book and everybody else's, but he really won't deal with mine, and I know that there's a specific reason why he won't. But uh, the difference between and most other futures is this. Uh, you, you see it on the thing there. Uh, the late date for the res late, uh, res uh, revelation authorship, I hold to that. Now, a lot of futures do, and a lot of don't, but Gentry and many of those others hold to the early, early date, which I don't. I think it's ridiculous to try to hold that, but that's a different discussion. I also believe that all of it was completely fulfilled in AD 70. Now, this is in line with N.T. Wright and many other top scholars um, and theologians. They're pretty much saying the same thing. It's not being agreed on by, by people down the run. Uh, they're digging in and holding on to what they believe and what they've been taught about the Olivet having a promise of a second coming, but 
um, the element doesn't contain. There is no promise of a second coming in in that. And of course, that's a different discussion. You can see other videos that I put up here. So of course, the, the destruction of that generation came upon Jerusalem only. Um, and recognize the time text of the gospel is referred to the events of AD 70. That's what I hold to. And then so Revelation is of a different time. It was written after 70 AD, so it has nothing to do with 70 AD. And this is a judgment that comes upon the whole world. It has nothing to do with something coming soon uh, because the word properly translated should be quickly. The events of Revelation happen quickly. And I think that's what's being stressed versus the 70 years of Babylonian captivity. This is a time of turmoil and tribulation that comes upon the whole world in seven years. In the same way that the judgment that came on uh, in Noah's day uh, with the flooding and the rain. Yes, he prophesied and, and preached for 40 years. But when the rains came until it ended, uh, all done within 80 days, I believe it was. Uh, so a very short time period. And uh, so I believe that all the revelations concerns the last day events. It doesn't concern... Uh, historism or idealism or anything else. I take most everything literally, and we can back that up by looking at the language that it says literal. There are so many clues as to being literal. And so this would be one of the the problems with uh, full preterism. Uh, well, I won't get into it right now. Um, so here's the challenge to Don Preston or to any three full preterists. This is something Sam and I have talked about before. It's still open. And our proposal is uh, sit down face to face, three sessions and discussions, three on three. So that would mean me and Sam and somebody else, whoever we figure out later on, uh, that is an agreement in a sense with us. Uh, it's hard to debate with and, and carry on a discussion when you've got Eastern Orthodox versus with, you know, a futurist like me and Sam. They're, it's not compatible in our views and some of the same things. So we don't want to cause too much division in between our one side, but we want to stick it on there. And so you got three on three, three full priders that are uh, CBV or three corporate uh, body, of course, or three individual. And that would be uh, with Ed Stevens and any two other people. We would love to be able to do. And we want to talk about a roundtable discussion, not another debate. And in a discussion, three topics. We divide a day up where we go on those three topics. I'm not mean, no, I'm not trying to do four. I'm trying to, <laughs> three. Uh, Spend the first one, just define the most common words that we talk about. Parousia, uh, epiphania, uh, ampontesis, um, all those basic words that uh, mellow, for example. And just go through a discussion and look at that and make and come to agreement about that. Then secondly, we would examine everything about the second coming. And then in the next session, uh, resurrection of the dead. So all we're looking for is three people who are willing to do that, either CBV or IBV. And if we want to do both CBV and IBV, you know, on two different dates and everything else, we're more than welcome. Uh, hey, come on. We, I will come out there uh, with Sam to Indianapolis, any church that's there that wants to take it and bring us in. Uh, and we'll do it there at your church. Uh, we can invite whoever you want, put it online, whatever we want. But the idea is that it's a roundtable discussion and not about a debate. Then that means we would have a monitor, uh, somebody there to monitor things and uh, just help to guide and facilitate the discussion and uh, kind of keep things on track and going the right direction. So that is uh, the challenge out to Don Preston. Now, here's what I was talking about, the weaknesses of full preterism. And, and this is my problem, any kind of discussion. And I'm going to go into Don's video here in just a minute. But the idea is this. They reject the historical testimony of the church post-87. So anything that the church fathers... So we can say that John lived in, after AD 70, as did Barnabas and, and Clement and Ignatius and several others, Polycarp, um, all those great men of faith, and they testified to things, but uh, the full project will totally ignore it and say it doesn't count, try to get these guys killed off, say that they're apost, you know, anything. Uh, but, of course, they can't get away with the fact that John lived to about 96, 98, or even up, possibly up in the 100 to the time of Trajan is the testimony by many church uh, historians and uh, people who wrote back in there. And so this is a historical fact, not a teaching fact. So that's the difference here. Uh, we all know Caesar committed suicide in 68. Why? Because everybody testifies to that historical fact. So when we talk about did Jesus come back, in, it should be in 87. Should that be a historical fact? Yes. So there should be people that are within history that should be able to testify and say, yes, 
That was the spiritual coming of Jesus in 70 AD. We all know that, but nobody says anything. In fact, all of them say that it's still future coming. So that is a major weakness for Pope Predestine, in ignoring that. Number two, any kind of discussion you get into with them, there's always this false hermeneutic. Uh, it is called predestined, you know, where they put in there timing dictates nature, um, audience relevance, and all these kind of things. Those are not accurate, real hermeneutics that we use. Those are invented by, by Predestines to help explain their, their system. So they give lyric service to historical grammatic method of interpretation. They don't actually use it. Uh, they give little service to the analogy of faith. I have, can show you similar verses from Matthew to Luke uh, and, and Mark that are speaking about the same things, but they will totally ignore it. Uh, Roy Runyon is, is king of doing that and uh, giving lip service. Uh, and then they also have the false idea of what exegesis. Now, I talked about this in my last video, but exegesis, of course, is a step-by-step -step process of coming to it based on uh, the words, the meaning of the words, then the meaning of the words in the context, and, and so forth. Um, exegesis is not going from verse to verse to verse trying to find similar wordings that are used in this. Just because the word stomach is used here and it's used there and it's over here doesn't mean all three are the same context, but that is precisely what uh, William Bell does in so many different ways. And so the most common, course, common charge, of course, is that they change the meaning of words to suit them I keep hearing it from William Bell, even to, you know, in the Predators Power Weekend that they had, you can hear how they changed the meaning of words and, and talk about it. Um, for instance, uh, Resurrection of the Dead. Resurrection, Anastasis Necron, is the standing end of a corpse. It's a noun. It is not a verb. But the verb form is not even Anastasis. That's the noun form of the verb. Um, so it can't be the verb form. The verb form is, means to be raised up. Anybody who gets raised up. Um, and it's always translated as raised up. So I, I get raised up out of my bed or I get raised up out of my chair. So you can find plenty of those. But anytime there's the event of somebody dead who is being resurrected life, it is, it, the word, the noun form of the word is to be used. And it means the standing again. And when it's associated with dead or implied with the dead, uh, concerning dead people, it is always implied as the standing again of a corpse, not of a spirit, not of a spirit being raised out of Hades and going into heaven. Um, that is just simply changing the meaning of words. So I know that they don't pay attention to the meanings of the words. They often complain. And then, of course, when it comes down to it, they will over-spiritualize uh, different texts. Now, let me switch out of here, and I am going to go to uh, Don Preston here, and I want you to listen. We're going to interact here with a little bit with this brand new book, but it's just things that he says uh, that I want to point out. A bit of text from the back cover. Quote, the entire futurist view of eschatology. I want you to, I want you to catch the power of this statement. The entire futurist view of eschatology, the end times, is dependent on the claim that Jesus' apostles were a okay, come on, my collective group of confused and ignorant men. That may strike you as powerful and a bit too strong, but I want to tell you, if you'll give it careful thought, you'll understand that this statement is absolute, absolutely true. No, it's not. And because you're dealing, when he makes a statement, he's talking about a lot of ignorant dispeace and things. Yes, they're all across the board there. But the true theologian, the true scholars uh, like N.T. Wright and following on through, we all hold to the fulfillment of the Olivet that was done in AD 70. It all came upon this generation. And I think this is why Don will not deal with me while he's got me blocked, because he doesn't know what to do with this. He does not know how to handle this idea of, of somebody agreeing. And, and see, I'm just standing in the same position, say, for example, of Barnabas. Barnabas, in his letter, and his epistle, he stated that the Olivet was all completely fulfilled according to the prophecies of Jesus. Um, even uh, Eusebius in his historian, he also affirms that Josephus was correct in what he was describing there um, and believes that this was the fulfillment of the Olivet uh, Discourse of the events of AD 70. But at the same time, as like Eusebius and others, uh, all presided over the Council of Nicaea, he in fact did, uh, where they all affirmed that Christ uh, had not come in AD 70, but his coming, second coming was still future. So, 
when he says this is the problem of all futurists, he can deal with that in a generic way, but he won't deal with people like me um, who actually do not believe that and have a, a slightly different opinion of that. To continue. In Matthew 24 and 2, Jesus predicted the impending destruction of Jerusalem's temple. But almost all commentators, almost all commentators, claim that the apostles were conflating that event with the return of Christ at a supposed future distant end of the Christian age. Yeah, he, he plays with words right there, but he says the point. They're confusing it with a future second coming. The Olivet with the, yes, that is the whole confusion because, and what's the heart of that whole confusion? Because everybody, both sides, full predators and dispies, make the same mistake. They think the Olivet is about the second coming. They see the language, Son of Man coming on clouds, and they assume this is about the second coming. Why is that assumed? Because in Acts 1, he says, if you saw him go into the clouds, he'll return to the clouds. And so, therefore, they assume this is also second coming language. And Son of Man coming in clouds, coming from Daniel 7, 13, 14, is not about second coming language. It's not considered a second coming prophecy. It is a prophecy concerning uh, the judgment that was to come upon Jerusalem in that generation. And I will repeat that till I'm blue in my face, but uh, people like David Green will completely twist what I say or miss what I say, um, add words to what I say because they're just not able to comprehend what we're saying age and that in doing so the apostles were obviously confused which means that it was not jesus's apostles that were confused about christ coming and the end of the age but in fact the confusion lies with the commentators who ascribe ignorance to them you know it's absolutely so no i i don't think about it think about it. The, the disciples they had no idea that he was going to even leave. No clue that he was going to leave, die, and leave. Why would he be talking to them about the second coming? See, like the, uh, uh, in Matthew 25, and it starts off with the bridegroom coming and going, and uh, the bride's not ready. See, we tend to take that into a second future in talking about that, but that's not about the second coming. That's about his first company. Think about it. The bride's gone. He's not there. And they're using Jesus as his first coming, as talking about a bride. When he comes, he comes to Jerusalem, but the people that were supposed to be the bride, the groomsmen, the people of Israel were not ready for him. Some came in and believed and others did not. That's what that's supposed to be applied to. It's about his first coming. They were not ready for the Messiah to come um, in the first place. And so you can see that different perspective just on that thing there alone. And it's not wrong to sit there and say, well, that's kind of similar to what might happen at the end, but because it, it deals with Israel and them not being ready, that's what it's about. Um, you can't put it into the future because it, it's not about the church not being ready. You, you get that? Not having enough, quote, unquote, Holy Spirit in or something like that. Uh, it's just stretch beyond credibility to put 25 as being about a future second coming. So let's move on here a little bit. That's the time of the destruction of Jerusalem. After telling that parable and applying Daniel 12 to it, Jesus asked his apostles, pay careful attention here, do you understand? Now, modern commentators would have uh, the holy people's completely shattered. Do you understand? And that, may I use the term? arrogance what does it take to say the apostles said they understood but they lied i don't care if you want to say uh you see his whole thing here he's going to go do this through the whole video talking about how those guys that are saying that are so wrong about that and i'm sitting here telling you don i agree with you i'm not disagreeing with that the ad 70 was the day the destruction the whole nine yards uh let's move on a little bit ahead if our computer will let me. On the shadow of a doubt, it is not the apostles of Jesus that were confused. It is the commentators who say, well, we know they said they were not confused. We know they said they understood, but really, 
honestly, they were confused. Yeah. Uh, so that's the whole thing, Don. And if I talk to you directly, I'm telling you, unblock me. Let me discuss and talk things with you. Um, because basically, I, I hate to say this, and I and won't borrow a term from you. might sound arrogant, but uh, uh, you obviously know the difference between somebody who, like an N.T. Wright and, and others who are saying the same thing, who agree with you in part uh, of those things and say that generation was all fulfilled, uh, the A.D. 70 and everything else. So where do you go would you, when you step there? Where do you go beyond that point? What more do we show? And I'll give you just a basic instance here and a reference to this. Um, we agree with Don that says that we will meet him in the air. The whole premise of some of those books is the idea that it is never God or Jesus in the Old Testament who came down personally and revealed himself. Or God showed up physically and appeared when those. It was always the army that came as a representative of God on the behest of his command of, of judgment as a form of judgment. So he's writing on the swift cloud. All of that language is talking about that. Uh, but here Jesus is different. Um, first of all, he came and became flesh, unlike his father. So when he came in the glory of his father, he came in physical flesh. Uh, on the day of transfiguration, he was still in the flesh body, but it changed in appearance before him. And uh, everybody could see that difference. Uh, he was still bodily when he transformed, they saw. So then, I got a text message I'm thinking about. I got to get back here online. Um from David Green, part of my ongoing conversation with him in, in the world of preterism, or on John Watson's video, I think it is, is where it's at. Uh, so where was I at? Okay, so he needs to deal with that. He needs to be able to step up to the plate and say, hey, can you actually deal with this? And so I was talking about Revelations 19. Now, here's the scenario of 19. It is the first half of the chapter talks is about the, uh, the rapture. It is talking about the saints, the marriage supper of the Lamb is what we understand is to be about the rapture. That's what the rapture is about. That's when the bridegroom comes and the church, the bride, meets him in the air. Uh, we become his armies, it describes. We're dressed in fine linen of the saints. And then we come back riding on white horses along with him to war. We become his army. So when Jesus returns, we come back as the army. Now that army defeats the beast, kills the beast and the false prophet. They are thrown alive into the lake of fire. Now, if you want to apply that to AD 70, you're, you're, all you can do is say that happened spiritually. Because obviously the Roman army came, defeated Israel, Jerusalem destroyed it, cast the people into captivity, took them home, scattered the whole nine yards. Jerusalem and Israel was completely destroyed. But what describes in second coming prophecies is that Christ comes to defend Jerusalem, the city that he loves. From Revelation 1, he defends that city and he gives salvation to the tents of Israel and Judah. And on that day, the inhabitants will have strength from the Lord. Um, and on that day, God will protect the inhabitants of Jerusalem. That's Zechariah 12, Zechariah 14. So I'm more than willing to debate on any of this and talk with him or anybody else in, in a debate. I'm getting tired of kind of messing with these idiots here. But um, so the point point is is that you have to spiritualize Rev 19 instead of accepting the fact that it is Jesus himself who descends out of heaven just to Acts 1 says he comes out of heaven he will come the same way you go where did he go he went from earth to into heaven and then from out of heaven he comes back to earth Zechariah 14 3 4 his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives um, and so that is what we understand about the nature of his coming uh, that's taught in the epistles and in Revelation so there's your difference. There's one of your main problems. So that it becomes a difficulty. It cannot be literal for the full preterists. They have to spiritualize, spiritualize that Jesus came in and uh, defeated the beast and all that spiritually. So um, enough said on all of that. This is my challenge to Don Preston. I'm going to post it around. And hopefully we'll get him to actually respond and, and take me off and uh, look at the book, whatever else. But, uh, man, we are so open to sitting down and having a round table face to face is not a debate it's not even funny so bring in daniel rogers you know bring in william bell bring three other people whatever three people you want to and we will go through those things with you and, and sit down and kind of let's settle this once and for all let this be the uh elijah against the <laughs> oh that sounds a little bit rough right uh against all the false prophets you know Baal. 
Um, let's go to Mount Carmel, people. Mount Carmel it is. <laughs> is that a place in Indiana called Mount Carmel? Let's go to Mount Carmel and let's duke this sucker out and let's see uh, once and for all. And uh, I'd love to have that discussion with you. All right. Thanks, guys, for listening, putting up with me for a little bit here. Uh, you guys have a good night, and we'll see you on the backside. And I hope.